Welcome back to the Home Lab and I've got another really interesting little project to show you today. What we're going to be looking at is a switch bounce detector. But first, just a very quick message to say thank you so much again to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and encouraging me to make more videos. As you know, I'm sure already, uh, they provide a service to makers like me. They do CNC machining, they do 3D printing, but especially with this project in mind, uh, they make bespoke circuit boards. And I've only built a project so far that's just on a bit of breadboard but if I was to take this a bit further, I would certainly be making a circuit board to go with this project. So if you've not seen what they do before, do go and have a look at their website and I'm sure you'll be impressed by what you see and get inspiration for your next project. Four. So let's have a look at my switch bounce detector. And if you're not familiar with switch bounce, what we're gonna do is we're going to get a mains light switch, switch it on and switch it on once. And I think you'll be surprised by just how many times this detects that you've actually switched it on. Right, let's have a look at our switch bounce detector in action. So let's turn on the electronics that measures the switch bounce. And if this is all a bit of a mystery to you, don't worry, I'm gonna explain it in a minute. I'm working entirely with low voltages, but I've got a normal mains house light switch here, and I'm just gonna switch it on once. And I don't know if you can see, but the bounce detector seems to think I've switched it on eight times. So we turned on the switch once, and rather surprisingly, my switch bounce detector said that we've switched it on eight times. So if you're not familiar with the effect of switch bounce, let me explain what's happening. A switch contains contacts that contact together, and in the case of a mains light switch, uh, they are pushed together and held together. But in fact, that isn't quite what happens when the switch operates. Because it's a mechanical system paired with electricity, as the contacts go together, they don't just contact and stay contacted. They hit each other and they bounce a little bit. And that's one of the many reasons for this detecting that the contacts have touched more than once before the switch is fully on. Let's reset our bounce detector. So there we go from eight to zero. Let's switch on again. And this time it reads six. So we've had six attempts at contacting whilst the switch has been trying to switch on once. Now you might say, well, how rapidly is this measuring that? Well, this uh, circuit measures at least, I think it's about five million times a second. So it should be capable of detecting multiple bounces. So there's another thing that's going on here and it's really quite complex. There may be some oxide on the switch contacts. And so they sort of contact, but not very well, then they disconnect and then not very well contact again. And this process can happen a few times until you get a really good connection. Also, the surfaces might not be completely flat. I mean, they clearly aren't on a simple main switch. And so um, it's sort of, contacts, then disconnects, then contacts, and finds a nice place to contact, finally, after six attempts, when the spring is pressing hard. Now, why does it matter? Why have I bothered going to all the trouble of showing you this? Well, in high voltage, high current circuits, there are some serious issues with switch bounce, and in low voltage, digital on off circuits, there are also lots of reasons that you don't want the switch to bounce. So. I'll explain those to you next. So why does it matter, switch bounce? Well, let's look at high voltage, high current circuits first. I'm sure you're aware that if you've got a very high voltage across a small gap, there's enough of an electric field there to cause it to arc if there are any uh, particles that can become charged between it. And that arcing will destroy the switch contacts, will slowly but surely burn them out. That's the same with high current circuits. If we have a large current flowing, um, that's the way the old arc lamps worked. You can actually um, destroy the contacts completely. You can either melt them or completely oxidize them. 
But with digital circuits, in some ways, the issue is even more serious. With digital circuits, as you know, it's a string of ones and noughts, and those ones and noughts individually each mean something. So you don't want any ones or zeros, ons or offs, creeping in unannounced. So if you think about it, if you press a switch that says, send a positive pulse down a cable, a one, if you've got a switch that bounces like this one, we will have just sent seven on-off pulses, and that could really confuse the electronics that we're dealing with, particularly if it measures very, very quickly. So when you build electronics, you have to debounce your switches. So you have to add some latches that once you press the switch, it remembers the very first making of the switch. And if it bounces after that, it doesn't matter. So it sends down the cable only the single pulse that you wanted and all the other multiple pulses are stopped. So the electronics gets the right signal. Once I had the idea of building this little project to show you what switch bounce was, I went a little bit crazy because I thought, why not buy a whole load of main switches and compare them? Now, there's no good reason to do that. Um, it was just an interesting thing to do to see whether a cheap switch was better than a more expensive one or the switch that's been used before bounces more or less than one that's brand new. And in fact, um, I'll show you the data in a minute and how I collected it. Um, one of the switches didn't bounce at all. In fact, um, it was completely faulty. It didn't switch at all and it was brand new. Um, there's no real worry with this kind of bounce with main switches though, because they make very quickly. So any arcing you would get would be minute. I must admit, um, I have had main switches, really old ones, where the springs are very weak and they don't make very quickly and you can actually hear a sort of crackling sound um, it, with the right um, environmental situation that might actually cause a fire so they definitely should be replaced but I thought they were nice and big you could see them easily on the video so it seems sensible to use main switches which were quite cheap and we could get some that were all fairly similar so let's see what I did to measure how different main switches performed as I said, I did go a little bit mad buying switches and uh, I can't remember how many I bought in the end, but here's just a few of them. And I tested all of these to see whether some bounce more than others. And if you remember, I even had one uh, that was completely faulty. So what we're going to do now is have a look at how I measured each switch and what the results were. So the first thing I did was spend a whole evening sitting in front of the computer watching YouTube videos, uh, not my own I hasten to add, uh, wiring up these switches to put the cables on the back ready to connect to my switch bounce detector. After that, the next thing to do was to connect them up to the switch bounce detector and switch on, write down how many bounces the detector showed and then try it again three times um, after that, that made for four measurements, and then take some kind of an average. I know that's not very scientific, but it gives you some idea of what I did to compare the different makes of main switch. So here's a quick look at the table that I did to show how many bounces I got from each switch uh, four times and then taking an average. And as I said, this is not scientific really in any way. It was just an interesting thing to do. Uh, very non-repeatable is what we find to begin with. So with some of the switches, uh, you've got a high number, then low number, then high number, then medium number. Um, I couldn't be certain I was pressing the switch in exactly the same way every time. It did seem to indicate that um, the first press often had a lot of bounces. And after that, maybe the contacts had bedded in slightly because the next press often was a lower or similar number. Um, I took an average to one significant figure. And again, I think from a scientific point of view, these are fairly meaningless. But it was clear that a couple of them came in quite low, particularly the one made by Contactum, which was new. And interestingly, the one made by Quattro that was used, but maybe because it was used, the contacts had been recently worn and it had worn the oxide layer off them. So does it make any difference when you buy main switches? I don't think it does. As long as they work and they click on quickly, that very rapid bounce isn't important. It would be important, of course, if you were using a main switch to switch a simple low voltage digital signal on and off. 
Let's have a quick look at the circuit now, and it's fairly simple to understand. So we've got nine volt uh, power rails here, our on off switch. Here's where our test switch connects, and there's a pull down resistor here. So that holds that point at zero um, and zero on pin one until this switch switches and then this line will be held positive for the duration that the switch is on. And as we know, the switch goes and bounces a few times. So we'll feed in a number of positive pulses. Then we've got a reset here. So again, we've got a resistor here to hold that line down low and it resets on a high pulse. So when we connect to the nine volts, uh, various other bits of wiring that are needed to make this chip work. And on the other side, the output, which is already coded for the seven segment display. So those lines go to the different segments of the display via their current limiting resistors and parallel out to the Darlington array that uh, because it's a sort of inverting one, um, it has a connection to the positive here. So it's a common anode, whereas this one is a common cathode. And there is our large LED display. So fairly simple circuit and not a particularly difficult one to build. Once I've designed a bit of a circuit diagram and that often changes during the build, it's time to put the thing together. And I always start off on a bit of breadboard and build it up a stage at a time. So the first thing to do was to get the counter chip working. So that's the CD4026 chip, which is a clever little chip because as you feed pulses into it, one, two, three, four, five pulses, it can output that on its output pins, but not as the numbers one, two, three, four, five, but perfectly coded to light the right segments on an LED seven segment display. So I got that bit wired up first and it counts all the way up to zero. And once it's reached zero, um, it's back to one again. So if you want to do 11, 12, 13, 14, you need another chip cascaded so, and another display so you can see uh, 10, 11, 12, the other digits that are needed. But I was expecting the switches only to bounce a few times, so I was happy just to have the one chip and one digit display. So with that working and the little LED display working, I thought it might be fun, even though you can see it perfectly well, to put in one of these really large uh, displays. And to do that, you need a little bit more current. So I've got a second chip that's a Darlington driver. And all that does is it sort of amplifies up the current so you can drive the bigger display. Once that was all sorted and working and I tested it all, I did my usual thing and went to a little bit of pad board or um, strip board or whatever you call it and uh, put the chips and resistors etc on the circuit and then wired them together with wires a bit at a time and I always make it work one bit at a time so I finally when I get to the end the whole thing should be working. Quick look at the circuit board we've built now and it's in one of these uh, circuit board holders that I absolutely love. I don't see many people using them, but they're the best £10 you can ever spend. So here are the wires going in that we connect the main switch to. And uh, you just ignore the colours here. I don't want any electrician saying, oh, you haven't sleeved one and blah, blah, blah. This is all incredibly low voltage stuff. It's just the cable I happen to have hanging around the house. So um, here's the input um, that feeds positive pulses into the 4026 chip that then counts one, two, three, four. It converts that count immediately to something that can be read by the seven segment display here uh, via resistors to limit the current to each section. And also paralleled out going to the Darlington array to the large um, LED display. And that one doesn't need current limiting resistors. The only thing I need to be careful of here is I think this is a common cathode and this Darlington inverts. So this is a common anode display. Oh, final thing I forgot to say, and it's the bane of my life when building projects, but it's worked out fairly easily here, is hiding at the back there, apart from all my soldering, is a little PP3 battery, and that'll drive the thing for ages because it uses hardly any current at all. So I do hope you enjoyed that video on my switch bounce detector and you feel that you understand a little bit more now about what switch bounce is and why it is important to understand it and in many cases stop it from happening. Anyway, I'll be making another video soon 
and I do hope you join me then.